So are markets setting themselves up for failure similar to how 2007 was going into 2008 as the yield curve was uninverting? Or are we setting ourselves up for missing out on a bullish run? That's the question we're gonna be trying to answer today. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're having a wonderful start to your day or end of your day, depending on where you are in the world. Jerome Powell has spoken today and he basically gave you probably the biggest nothing burger in existence, but we can turn to the charts to determine if we're gonna have this continuation. We also got GDP today on deck. So it's gonna be a very, very interesting time, right? So if we go over to the economic calendar, we can see we got some data for new home sales and it wasn't essentially stellar, but it was okay, right? A new home sales are going in the right direction. We're still not seeing the degradation in the housing sector. And also we got GDP coming out today, expectation of 3%. I personally think it's gonna come in right at that number. I don't think Jerome Powell is gonna even spook the market in any way, shape or form. He may completely reframe from speaking about interest rates as a whole, right? He'll basically say, hey, you got the SCP, you got our comments. Basically, you know what, hands off. Now the bond market doesn't necessarily agree with him because the bond market has been doing one simple thing and that is churning up higher on the yields, especially the longer dated yields. As we saw on the 18th and when Jerome Powell came out and spoke, it, all the longer term yields were basically saying, yeah, you're pricing in higher inflation in the long term, so we're gonna demand a higher rate. What does that necessarily mean for the entire economy? Well, it means borrowing costs are not gonna be cheaper. Remember, banks loan, they borrow at the short term and loan at the end of the term. So your credit card payments, your mortgage payments, they're all gonna be higher. And what does this necessarily mean for the rest of the market? Does this affect stocks? How does this affect stocks? How we can play it? Well, sectors like, for example, KRE or regional banks aren't necessarily gonna benefit from this, right? They've been struggling since the expectation of these 50 basis point cuts came out. They've been struggling to really gain any momentum. So we have to look at sectors that are more long-term dated with correlation to the S&P, right? Those smaller sectors haven't been doing too well, especially with the Russell, right? So the Russell was coming out and basically just churning down lower. You would expect, as Tom Lee said, that the Russell was going to have a 40% rally. Tom, I'm still waiting for this 40% rally and it's not happening. Now, I truly think it can happen because the Russell has historically torn everyone's face off every time anyone looks at this the wrong way. The concern is you have a W pattern here that you're basically breaking down. So we need to start rallying now, 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 and we are setting up for that, right? So we got a couple things I wanna point out. First of all, is the net speculative positions shorting 122,000 contracts. This is bare fuel to go higher. We saw what happens when they double down, where they have to capitulate, and if they don't capitulate soon, that could fuel the market to go higher and higher and higher and higher. Uh, what do we have to break in order to basically continue going higher? Well, we covered it in the weekend deep dive, but I'm gonna go over it real quick here for you guys, which is these levels that we went over in the weekend deep dive, link down in the description below. And also if you guys wanna understand how you can profit from these market movements, uncertainty in the market movements, through the options plays that I went over. I'll be discussing that later in part of the video, but also I'll have that video that digests options as a whole and shows statistically how they are structured, which option plays you should avoid and should play. That'll be linked as well in the description below. So looking at the totality of the situation, the S&P isn't in a bullish tonation still. We can go through the checklist. Are we above the weekly high? No, okay, so strike number one. But are we above the nine day and the rotationary point? Yes, we're above 550.65 and we're above the nine day moving average thing right now at the 566. So two levels of support that we're above, we're not below 559 to be bearish, right? So we got no bearish intonation, we're above the 50. Okay, so everything's checking out good. The only thing we need to do is break above 572. NASDAQ actually had an interesting story. This is a little bit bearish, but it's also bullish. You gotta look at the totality of the situations. We're going into news catalyst events and we're closing near the high for it going into the news catalyst events. So 486.23 is the upper boundary. We actually broke out all the way to 488. So we made a new high. We're pushing back above it with tech, trying to rally. It's, it's having a little bit of a struggle, but the question is, is that struggle gonna continue going into PCE? Is PCE gonna ignite? Remember what Waller said? He said that inflation is gonna come in significantly below expectations and PCE was the thing he actually referred to. So if we look at PCE expectations, they still haven't published them, 
But then again, if this thing comes in, let's say 2.4 for each, maybe 2.5, 2.4, the markets will cheer this as progress on inflation, continuation of the Fed rate cuts, and pricing in this 50 basis point cut right now will be basically a guarantee going probably 60, 70, 80% that we're getting another 50. That'll be 1% interest rate cuts in the bond markets and that's going to be inflationary down the road but the problem is the markets are not necessarily pricing that in now they're not pricing in risk if they were pricing in risk we wouldn't be in greedy territory like we are now basically pushing to extreme greed right we saw what happens when we get to extreme greed we get these crazy crazy rallies where the market just rallies 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 with no end in sight and the question i have for all of you are you going to get in front of that freight train? Are you, or do you, is it easier just to ride that freight train, kind of leave your opinion on the side and maybe bruise and your ego may be bruised a little bit because you're not necessarily on the right side of history, but who cares? You're making money. That's all that really matters in the grand scheme of things. So again, recapping what we need to do with the markets. If we're breaking above 486.23 on the NASDAQ, if we're breaking above 572 on the S&P, we're looking for bullish trades out there. Now, let's flip the script real quick and talk about the bearish situation. So now we just have a dissection of both sides, right? So we kind of gave you the bull script. Now let's talk about the bear script. First of all, VIX continues to head down to $12. Why is that significant? That was a previous low and is forming a low right here where it could, maybe could, be in a position where it's going to start rallying again. We don't see any evidence yet, but we're in this limbo state with VIX where we could essentially get a pop off. If we don't get a pop off and we actually get a shrink or in, we don't get it into PCE, which would be today when you guys watch the video, VIX is basically still sitting at 15-ish. We're heading into a very bullish PCE event. If we get it post-mortem PCE, right? Okay. The catalyst has to be there, right? The catalyst, the PC has to come in stubbornly or come in higher. That'd be the catalyst for VIX to have another spike. If we don't get that, there's no evidence that we're actually going to continue in the bearish thesis, right? We're going to have to look at the bullish thesis that we just went over. Now, let's say we go down to $12. That'd be an interesting buying opportunity to hedge against the markets, right? If you don't want to be fully exposed to the market, then you can just basically uh, VIX at $12 by $18 calls or about $100. And they're pretty damn cheap, right? They're not super expensive. And you can keep rotating in these for a small position size, but actually a large payout. It's like a 30 to one payout. I've done videos on VIX before, but the futures market, we're showing continuation of bullishness. So again, heading into Asia, we were bullish, probably going to have a London bullish session because last night we didn't really get that bearishness from London that we saw during the day was a chop fest. So we're setting up for a big move. So with setting up a big move going into GDP, Powell and PCE, we could see with those double stacked S&P days, right? But now this is where we have to look out carefully. The Russell is not in a good point. We see a lot of money being concentrated in these bigger cap stocks right now, but the Russell has been lagging all the way since August, right? It has been struggling Going into these catalyst events, it was selling off going into the Fed, selling off going into August, selling off now. So we've been stagnant on the Russell, which is the uh, IWM, you can trade it there. And we're threatening that 50 day moving average again. If we come down and we bounce off the 50 day moving average heading into PC, that could set up for a very interesting bear squeeze. However, if we break the 50 day moving average, then it's just gonna be a further question of how much downside we can potentially have. And if the Russell goes, it's gonna drag the S&P, it's gonna drag the NASDAQ, and it's gonna drag enthusiasm to continue running bullish. And then the questions of has the Fed essentially set us up for failure, right? If we look at the yield curve, we can see that this thing is uninverting at a very rapid rate. That is cause for concern, considering that once we get down into this 1% inversion territory, that is when things really start to break. And two consecutive 50 basis point cuts would show historically what happens, right? If we look at when the Fed really starts jacking up these cuts going into 2019, we remember that. We can also go back historically, right? April of 2007, we really didn't see the carnage until this uninversion really started happening, where the Fed was basically cutting rates into the crisis of 2000, 2008. But then again, we, we saw that going into the end of year of 2008, October, November, that inversion started hitting 1%, and then all the carnage started. So we have to be cautious about things like this, where this is looking very similar to history before, and we saw what happens, right? A lot of people are not wanting to hold risks, well, especially with the KRE, right? Regional bank sector. Everyone's looking at this, 
below the 50 day moving average. This is bearish, right? So we're seeing certain sectors be bearish, right? The ones that everyone was kind of like piling in, they're like, eh, maybe we shouldn't pile out, right? We had one of the catalysts was that the government was going to shut down, but we got the House uh, passes the stopgap bill to avert government shutdown. Again, as much as you may err on one side of the politics or other, it doesn't matter now. This is a catalyst that has been removed. It can't be a point of contention for the markets. So we got some sectors that are being a little bit bearish, but if we look at the totality like the TLT, kind of cooling off now, now are we gonna start another rally in the 10 and um, two year, right? To maybe get some of that bounce back, or are we just gonna keep getting higher in those yields? Remember, the 10 year is what mortgages are correlated to, and they're essentially in a position right now that since the Fed's meeting, they're basically kind of pricing in. Has the Fed lost the fight in inflation? We also see other things like China's 10 year yield basically hitting lows that no one's, everyone's running to the bond market in China, right? So if everyone's piling into the bond market and the ETFs, the big leverage isn't necessarily the new shiny thing, it begs the question of how long it can last without that money flowing in. And that's what we're gonna be trying to answer over the next subsequent weeks. We're gonna do a deeper analysis on the weekend deep dive so make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel so you guys know when exactly that comes out that's how we get these levels that are here if you guys are interested in the weekend deep dive it'll be queued up over here for you so you can check it out and let us know in the comment section down below what you think of this video also what you think about our other videos and we hope to see you in the live stream that we're having tonight at 7 p.m eastern we're gonna be going over Jerome Powell's speech going over Costco earnings so definitely be an interesting one so thank you all so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next one